You're here to take the moral high ground, right? Because yeah. eating for the Venezuelan hate Maduro. We can earn our stripes here, right? So, you take out Maduro. There's a lot of stuff that is vague about this bill. This bill is not a simple bill. In this short paragraph, it talks about how we're going to block cryptocurrency from being used. Being used. Some Republicans are for this bill. Yes. Men are. Yes. 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 The crisis in Venezuela has gone out of hand. Millions of people are fleeing the country and millions more are starving. A corrupt and dictatorial government sits in power, and this needs to be dealt with immediately. This is why this is why I, Mark Rubio, helped write this bill. If you're a Republican, think of the illegal immigrants that will come to our country because they're fleeing persecution. If you're a Democrat, think of all the people who are starving and need our help. Maduro's reign was a cultural hegemony where the ruling class forced the citizens to believe that what they were doing was right, and this must be changed. Venezuela is, forced, is in a humanitarian crisis. They don't have enough food, and the government is oppressing them. We can't just resort to trying to overthrow Maduro because it would infringe on his sovereignty. Um, so there have to be other solutions. I think that Venezuela is in a greater state of crisis than we think it is. Maduro must be replaced and a democratic government must be reinstated. The means by which the bill proposes to reinstate this democracy is very weak and vague. Currently in Venezuela, there's a massive inflation rate. To give you some perspective, a roll of toilet paper costs the amount of, of, of stack of boulevards, their currency, larger than the actual roll itself. As Senator Cory Booker, item 4, Senate Bill S.3486. Also, I would be open to anything concerning peace without starting a war in Venezuela, and if that includes overthrowing Maduro in a peaceful way, I could be open to that. Thank you. As a result of such poor living conditions, over, over a million Venezuelan people have fled to the surrounding countries, causing the crisis to expand not only in Venezuela, but in the surrounding countries. Overthrowing Maduro, I, don't, I personally think, is not practical, as we have seen the Bay of Pigs invasion and other uh, U.S. attempts to overthrow dictators in um, Latin America, I believe that this could allow for chaos and destabilization in, uh, in a place that, quite frankly, we should not meddle with. And the Peace Corps are U.S.-owned, and they're more used to giving humanitarian relief. And while some of you say it's, my, it's dangerous, that's what they signed up for. If we need someone, then we should use the more U.N., more trained, and more successful in the dangerous times group. The peacekeepers, thank you. You guys have a uh, 10 minute online. Uh, <laughs> However, you have to realize that it's not like whether the peacekeepers of the Peace Corps go in with a difference. Maduro knows that he's unpopular. He doesn't care. He wants to keep power no matter what it takes. And second of all, the Peace Corps is at our disposal. The peacekeepers are not. We have to ask the Security Council for their permission. Russia and China work with Venezuela in dealing with oil and stuff. And they don't want to send their soldiers. They don't want to give us approval to use their peacekeepers to go in and disrupt that function. Innocent citizens, well-meaning citizens, plus extreme danger equals not good. But then uh, some delegates on my side told me that we can protect the peace corps because we are directly connected to them. We can send protection along with them and curry favor from Venezuelan citizens at the same time. We do not think that just supplying um, humanitarian aid will fix the problem. It is just a... Um, a toilet bowl of us sending money and sending money and sending money, but it doesn't stop the root of the problem. The root of the problem is the corrupt government. And we can give humanitarian aid until the end of time, but it's not gonna change how they're treated in Venezuela. 
The only way to bring change is to change the government at the top, and then that will bring down change on the rest of the people. Humanitarian groups will, will easily be hurt, and then also it's not good to involve other countries. Giving it to an NGO will lose a measure of control over the money, and what's the point in that? I would say we should send in these people unarmed, just because this is more about conveying a message to the populace that our democratic ideals actually would help them in life. I think we should use another country that is near there so they can help the refugees from Venezuela in their country and they can also help the Venezuelans. Because they should be on better terms than we are with Maduro because they're his neighbor. And I think that would be a much better solution. Maduro is a rational person. He knows that if he attacks U.S. citizens, that gives us an excuse to overthrow him. So why would he do it? Well, the U.S. has uh, tried to intervene in, uh, in Latin American politics for over a hundred years, and every time it has re uh, resulted in, um, in many lives being lost. Even if the U.S. does have the power to go invade Venezuela and take it over, why would we want to burden our country with Venezuela's problems? We are restoring human decency to the nation. We are the land of the free and the home of the great. We, we have every right to restore democracy and human rights and well-being to the nation of Venezuela. We want oil. <laughs> Therefore, we will take over Venezuela. I feel that our number one priority to these people should be food and medical attention. There are so many injuries in Venezuela, and these people are starving on the streets. What's going to stop Maduro, Maduro from denying those NGOs from coming in? He knows that they're, that they're set with American money, so why won't he just stop them from coming, coming in? The mass population is starving. We, we could give them medical aid, we could give them medicine and shelter, but they will still starve. We need to give them food for them to survive. It is one of the necessities of life. When we were giving food and giving humanitarian aid to the citizens, they are not pressured to vote for Maduro. In result of this, a bunch of Maduro followers are lost, which may result in him in the next election not being elected again, which may be one way of taking him out of government. Maduro's elections are rigged. That's how he was able to stay in power for so long, and why such a majority? We know that the majority of Venezuelans do not support him. However, he is still in power through illegal means. He said that he is maybe oppressive, but regime change is not the goal. We need to be able to help the Venezuelan people and not create more crisis in an already sorrow state. But what we can do is allow for fair elections by providing aid to the people so they are no longer dependent on Maduro, providing infrastructure so everyone can get to voting places, all the things one does to provide fair elections. And then, as over 80% of the Venezuelan Venezuelan population disapproves of Maduro, then they will vote him out of power, and so he will be removed from power without us directly doing that. We can do that peacefully and without um, as much intervention as we would have without directly taking Maduro out of office. He's been bribing people with um, so-called debit cards that he can give them food. I think this um, needs to end. We have always believed that influencing foreign, foreign affairs is against our values, and this is this is exactly that. But we can't have something as astonishingly high as two billion dollars. The United States does not have uh, that money just lying around. Um, this is where I would like to bring up the F-135 jet um, production of the United States, where the United States has invested $2 billion into the program, and we currently have done nothing with that money and have not done anything for the last couple of years with that $2 billion. This is just sitting around and can be used to able use, such as the Venezuela project. Also, I would like to point out that the Republicans have refused to invest in helping the America, um, just everyday and working class Americans in the United States, oh, and okay. yet oh, wants oh, to okay. give okay. millions, okay. billions of dollars to another country exactly. that is not our responsibility. I, I just believe in kind of outsourcing and, and asking um, organizations such as the, the Lima Group or OAS to also provide funding. Nine meals. We are not giving them enough to buy any good medical supplies. We are not giving them any good 
clothing, we are just giving them nine meals. If outsourcing is important, if we do not want to fund the very thugs that are stealing from innocent people, then we need to reconsider our budget. We need more than just $58 million because although it is stronger in Venezuela than it is in America, we have to think about the cost of resources internationally, not in Venezuela. Instead of giving the money to the Venezuelan people themselves, we are giving them to the nonprofits. The nonprofits will actually know what to do with the money, including buying ingredients and giving a fair share of uh, materials to the Venezuelan citizens, including technology aid, medical aid, and basic toiletries. We are not just giving them to the Venezuelan people to spend. How much money does the United States put on stamps per year? Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, costs about $70.9 billion uh, in uh, 2016, and it supplied about $44.2 million Americans. Did you guys hear that? Wait, what? Ooh, that's game. As it stands right now, you guys are totally even. You have 10 in each party, and in, in the event of a tie, it fails. So Republicans, if you wanted uh, to pass something, you would need at least one Democrat, and the same goes for Democrats. One Democratic. Most money should be spent on medical supplies, not simply because they are important. Food and other and education are just as important as well. But that medical supplies are much more expensive. We need to prioritize things like education so that future generations can have a long-term, lasting impact of Venezuela. Right now is simultaneously you guys seem to want to prevent a humanitarian crisis understandably from occurring however at the same time any actions you take to help the venezuelan people could end up effectively propping up the venezuelan government the likelihood that venezuela would attack people who they've allowed into their country to give aid is very low this amendment would probably just create more instability and more tension and less help from the Venezuelan people. There is an amendment going around about sending NGO groups to Venezuela. We are getting closer to deciding the amount of money, so it's not too much or too little and does not make a big impact on the U.S. We're going to send NCOs, non-government organizations, but I think this is a big risk because without protection for the NCOs, they will most likely get killed by the large numbers of gangs in Venezuela. I think that it is completely unnecessary to send protection with um, these NGOs. These NGOs are meant to be sent as peaceful offerings of um, goodwill and uh, health benefits and supplies to the Venezuelans, and sending a uh, sending protection with them makes something that was once an offering of peace look like a um, a breach of their sovereignty. The people of Venezuela are starving. They need aid, like, right now. So what will this bill, like, help with that? Because it, you say that it kind of, like, changes what you think of Venezuela. But how does that really help to the top? The U.S. is a world leader, and what the U.S. says or thinks about another government could have an international impact and put more pressure on the Venezuelan government. Because if the U.S. doesn't recognize uh, Venezuela as a legitimate government, there's a good chance that we could convince other countries not to recognize them. And if they're not being recognized as a legitimate government, they have no power. This uh, has passed. Please. Yes. Quiet, but understand. Congratulations on passing your first amendments to this bill, which I know is a behemoth of the bill itself. Ten minute moderate caucus, one minute speaking time to discuss the drug trade. Those delegates in favor? <laughs> I encourage you all to think of several ways that we can stop these drugs from being made in the first place so we can stop them from getting to the United States of America. The underlying roots of all these drugs are where the plants come from. If we can, if we can like, take away all the plants and we can also find out who else there is, then, then, then the drugs won't be a problem anymore in Venezuela. They may actually need more something like rehab than years in jail. I would also like to point out to everyone that's saying we should take down the drug lords. That is a massive, massive undertaking. We are extremely underestimating how powerful these organizations are. 
and that the amount of money and time and power it will take to overthrow them, with that amount of money, we could save so many lives through food and medical care and education instead. I think at this point, we need to be able to propose our amendments, get them passed, and create a piece of legislation that, bipart that is bipartisan and all of us can be proud of. There is a uh, total budget for this project of $75 million, which I think is actually a very good number. Um, in fact, some could say perfect. This sweet spot is um, $100 million. Better the overestimate than underestimate. So that's, that, that is why I think she put $100 million in. But what these sanctions do is they hurt the people. By hurting the people, you contradict your goal and you do absolutely nothing but inflict worse scenarios than what's already happened in Venezuela. From what we can see, Maduro is by no doubt a cruel man, but he is not a fool. This bill and his writers both make the assumption that Maduro will engage militarily if confronted with force. This is a huge blunder in the reasoning and implementation of the bill. Sanctions will not directly harm the people, will not directly kill the people, while a war can easily bomb the people and seriously kill large numbers of these innocent citizens. The punishments that will be levied on the government should not negatively affect the people. We, we should pursue other, better solutions that allows the people of Venezuela to not only have their government handouts, but to also have the, NG, have the provisions that the NGOs are going to provide. question is if there's a particular clause within a uh, motion or an amendment that is rather contentious, we vote on it separately. We vote first upon the contentious clause on whether or not it's included in the full bill and then on, upon the bill itself. I generally would say most effectively used by the sponsors of the bill who want to put in something controversial but are okay with the controversial bit failing um, as long as they can get the rest of it to pass. So it's a very, very useful procedural motion. As in any other points or motions, we're going to enter into formal voting procedure. All those in favor? So strong. Okay, all those opposed? Actually, yeah. This, President, this amendment has passed. Yeah. Yeah. that the government will benefit more than the people. Well, the government would naturally receive I believe, more tax dollars, right? But still, the people would be able to give those tax dollars and be able to earn a living again. A motion for a 10-minute unmoderated caucus. All those in favor of a 10-minute unmoderated caucus to discuss this, work on it. Um, yes, this passes. This is a great time to address any last concerns about funding, etc. This bill is uh, really risky. Spend too much money on one company, and it does not go well. But if th there's good outcomes, good outcomes could come as um, stabilizing the government and, and uh, helping the people, as well as uh, gaining gain tons of money back from investments. I think 15 million is an appropriate amount. This amount of money is not that much in comparison to other projects, in comparison to what we spend on humanitarian aid. And I think that the risk is manageable. Um, what's the current funding for the um, the wind and solar? About $5 million. Um, I think that's a bit too much, considering that that is one-third of the total funding. And I think that focusing on wind and solar, while might be very effective, is a... Um, Bit thinking too far in, in advance for Venezuela, for they should just be, we're just focusing on their basic needs. So I think that should be lowered to around one to two million dollars. 
I do agree with Senator Paul that five million might be a little bit much, but it's still climate change is a very large issue, so we need a decent amount, not one or two million, but maybe four. It's the hyperinflation and its economy you said an all time low, and the fact that when people can't even feed themselves, I I just I think I first of all I don't think this is really like a present concern. I think it's a waste of aid, and I also think it's just not going to get any return. It's not going to help people either. If we start doing this with every impoverished country, if we do this to Iran, if we do this to Syria, then it's all going to add up, and by the time we're done, and it will be about $1 billion, which will go even deeper into our debt. And yes, maybe we might have some success, but we don't know. We're not venture capitalists. We're the U.S. government, and we need to spend our money on more useful things. Thank you. Welcome to our closing ceremonies. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking all of the delegates for all of your long hours of debates all weekend long. To that end, we're going to hear from a variety of delegates from each committee and then their chair or the debate uh, moderator for that committee. Respect plays a massive role in life. There are any type of relationship you have with someone, there is respect. If one does not respect the other, then the relationship does not work whether it be for work, negotiation, friendship, love, looking at you parents, or others, it's always necessary. In debate it is also extremely important. But what people often neglect and what I believe is the more important part is working with the other party. You need to be, able to, you need to be willing to compromise and, dele and delegates that um, don't compromise and just, they strong, and just are unwilling to yield anything will not get any of their amendments passed. But now I know. Even small topics make amendments greater and make them more likely to pass. So um, first of all, before I begin, let's just have a round of applause to all of the instructors and all of the people who made this um, very memorable experience and LCM in general happen. So I feel like the first thing that was very effective was being the, the loudest and most disruptive person in the room. Another thing, that I found very helpful was actually backroom dealing. Um, many, those who actually um, spent a lot of time trying to coordinate with other senators, I found were the most successful. Because if you are not able to form relationships and trust, you are not able to unite your caucus or unite your opposing party or your opposing countries. I was really impressed at the level of personal growth I saw within delegates though. Um, from learning that screaming decorum delegates doesn't actually create decorum to really the potential for creating something as a group. I've been with LCM for a long time and yet still I end up being surprised at the amount of emotional and personal energy that goes into um, every single one of these simulations, and so it was just an honor for me to be able to come back and experience that again. Hello everyone, my name is Nikhil, um, and I'm a current sophomore here at UC Berkeley studying computer science. Um, I joined LCM when I was in seventh grade. Over my six years as a delegate, I experienced, I mean, profound professional and personal growth. Um, so in terms of professional growth, I learned to publicly speak, I learned to form convincing arguments, and to deliver them in at least a semi-interesting way. In terms of personal growth, I felt that I grew into a more confident individual. I met some of the most interesting people I've ever met through Model UN. Just to conclude, uh, one thing that very few people know is that Model UN was actually created here at Berkeley. Uh, the first ever conference was Berkeley Model United Nations, and that was in 1952, uh, just seven years after the founding of the United Nations. Uh, and so I think that it's really cool that you guys are all taking some of your first steps in this awesome debate format uh, at Molly Lehman's birthplace. So with that, we conclude our conference. Thank you to all the parents, to all the wonderful teachers, instructors, and most of all, to all the delegates. Thank you. Thank you.